and we will begin. Okay, so welcome everybody uh, to this National Geographic Learning Professional Development Webinar. Uh, in today's session, we'll be looking at teaching tips and techniques, and we'll be taking part in some activities from two National Geographic Learning programs. Uh, we're focusing on how to approach teaching the productive skill of speaking. So it's arguably the most important skill, and it's the one which can be, in my opinion, the most difficult to teach. If you don't know me, my name is Will Lachette, and I am an academic consultant and teacher trainer for National Geographic Learning. I have been living and teaching and training in English language teaching in Asia since 2001. And while we're talking about my teaching experience, I'm interested to find out a little bit about you. So I'm going to launch a poll. Um, I just want to know what kind of teaching you do yourself, what segments you're teaching. It's multiple choice, so you can select as many as you like. Um, if you're on Facebook, uh, you can't access the live poll, but you can type into the comments. And you can tell us what you teach there. So if, for example, you teach young learners and teens, you can type that into the comments. OK, if you're if you're on Zoom, you should be able to see the um, should be able to see the poll and you can just click on the ones which are true for you. So at the moment, we've got um, more than 300 people here already, and uh, just over 70% of you have voted. Good. Someone says in the chat box, uh, Tiona says, I always enjoy National Geographic Learning webinars. That, that makes me very happy to hear that. Excellent. Thank you for saying that. Okay. Let's, uh, we've got 80% voted, so let's end the poll, okay? Oh, it's an interesting place, let's share the results. So you should be able to see the, the answers, the results here. We can see it's very close. So we've got 51% of you teach young learners, 50% teach teens, okay? So half of you, the majority of you here teach young learners and teens, which is perfect because, um, you know, uh, although the, the tips and techniques we're looking at today can be applied to different age groups, the materials and the content we're looking at is aimed at young learners and teens, okay? So that's very nice for me to know. But if you are teaching university or adults, um, you know, what I'm talking about today can definitely be applied. All right, let's have a look. So um, yeah, I just mentioned the content. So the programs I'm looking at today are Our World Second Edition. This is a seven level program for young learners of English, ages six to 12. And we're also looking at impact. This is a five level program for secondary or teen students. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to be showing you examples. So let's talk generally, okay? To, to teach speaking, we need to make sure, first of all, we need to make sure that speaking in English feels comfortable and feels normal for our students. So I'm going to give you uh, sort of three general tips for this. But before I do that, I want to hear your opinion. Um, I want to hear what you think. So I'd like you please to type into the chat box for me now. Um, in your classes, what are the, the rules that you have about encouraging students to speak? How do you make speaking possible? in your classroom. So Thomas has put, I use role plays, collaboration. Uh, Mammy has an all English policy, debate, okay, asking questions, conversation. Uh, Loan also has this English only policy. Uh, ice breaking, that's a great idea. Open-ended questions, showing some toys, reporting, sing a song. Great, so we've got lots of activities here. I'm kind of talking about general rules that you try to apply. So for example, the sp only speak English, this is a rule, right? Um, simple, Hong Vien says simple basic conversation first. Uh, Thomas says mini teaching, no mother tongue. Okay, speak 
as words, if not sentences. I think you mean there. So even if they can't say the whole sentence, they should at least use the words that they know, right? So use what you know. I like that, Rena. That's a good rule. Um, okay, so we've got loads of ideas here. Um, Amos says, show students that we all make mistakes and encourage them to speak. And I think that's a very good point as well, right? Um, to, to show our students it's okay to make a mistake, yeah? Okay, so I'm gonna show you my ideas. Um, thank you for your participation there. So here are my sort of three general rules that I like to apply. So I'll explain them a little bit. So make your classroom an English speaking environment. This is to do with setting expectations. So we need to make it clear to our students that we expect them to speak English as much as possible. So obviously it depends on their age and their level. We can't expect perhaps, you know, very young learners to speak in English all the time. They can't, right? But as much as possible, we want to make it an English speaking environment. We can remind our students about this as much as possible and we can model it ourselves as teachers but if we use English all the time okay so we should be modeling the behavior secondly my second point is to support students and to praise their English use so we try not to make speaking scary so many students are shy they lack confidence in English and if they don't like speaking in front of the class to begin with we shouldn't try and force them so we should find other ways to, to encourage them to speak in pair work individually. We can still listen to them speak. So we don't want to um, put our students off. We don't want to scare them. And this, I put his uh, praise, we need to really make sure that we're making them feel good about the English that they're using. Right. So I think that's something very important. My third point is to use every speaking opportunity. Uh, we need to remember that speaking is not only done in speaking activities, it should be throughout the lesson. We should be using every opportunity. So one big opportunity I think teachers often miss is for example, when we're checking answers. So we often ask our students to check answers in pairs and you will recognize this yourself. If you ask students to do that, they look at their partner's book, they look at their book and they go, A, B, C, B, D, A, B, done. And that's it, okay? They, that, that's all they do, right? But that is a great opportunity um, to use English. So they could be saying, what did you put for number one? And their partner would say, well, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think the answer is A. Okay, what did you put? Um, and, and they can have a whole speaking interaction in English, simple language, but they're speaking in English, right? So use every opportunity. Okay, so this is part of our mini series, Keeping It Real. Um, and I want to share the following tips about real speaking. So firstly, I think that the secret to success in speaking activities or all teaching really is based on preparation. So good preparation, good setup from the teacher, because we can't just expect our students to fully engage with the task without this real thorough preparation. Secondly, we want to use real content. And the content should be engaging and it should be interesting. And we believe, National Geographic Learning, that authentic or real content is the best way to interest and motivate students because we naturally have more to say. We relate to real material more. Thirdly, we want to give real tasks. So the task or activity we give our students should, as much as possible, reflect real situations, real life, and it should use real language okay this way students can easily see the benefits they can relate to the task and they can understand why they're using this language and why they're doing this task so the task should have real language and be set in real settings okay so here is an example okay from our world second edition level three and this is from a unit called what's for dinner and here we have a values lesson about uh, the importance of eating good food. And it encourages students to think about the food that we eat. So it's bringing together ideas and concepts from all of the real content in this unit. 
Um, and it's a think, pair, share activity. So I like this activity because it's a, a good model for a speaking activity. We'll talk more about the importance of having time to think before we speak later on. Um, this page contains wonderful image of the giraffes here and it gets students discussing real questions. So let's see this first question. Why is it important to eat good food? So I would like you now in the chat box, can you answer this question for me? Why, why is it important to eat good food? Right, so we need nutrition, says Michelle, to stay healthy. It makes you healthy, great. To live longer, to keep fit so you can feel good. Okay, lots of, oh, the chat box is moving so fast. So we don't get cancer, right, okay. To avoid illness, right? Loads of good ideas coming in here to have a sound mind. So we can start off, this is a fairly, um, you know, fairly easy question to answer. It's easy for our students to engage with this, to be healthy. We know that, okay, students know they should eat good food. The second question I think is really important and it's teaching, it's teaching something that has real world application. And it's maybe something that our youngest, remember this is for primary students, for younger students, maybe nine-year-old students, maybe something they don't know a lot about. So let's look at the second question. Why should you read the labels on boxes and cans? So can we try and answer that question now? Why should you read the labels on boxes and cans? Right, to know the, to know the nutritional value, to know if it's safe to use. So some of you are talking about the expiry date. Awareness, right, to know about the ingredients. To, to count the calories okay so it's not just the calories though is it because not every calorie is the same you know um calories which come directly from sugar for example okay are, are not as good as calories that we might get from protein okay um so yeah we need to know this nutritional value and uh, maybe you can tell me what is the What's the real world application here? So we're looking, we're talking to our students about looking at nutritional information on boxes and cans. Um, what's the real world application? What are we really encouraging our students to do? Someone says, do you check the labels? I do. Uh, when I buy things, I, I check the labels. Um, to care about, we're teaching them to care about their health, we're teaching them to be aware, we're teaching them to avoid harmful effects, right? So something that I've noticed, uh, particularly because I'm buying breakfast cereal for my daughter, who's a toddler, I've noticed on cereal boxes here, they always say things like, now with less sugar, okay, now with less sodium, now with less fat, new improved healthy recipe, right? Have you seen this? So if you just look at the box, it's saying, this is healthy. It says so on the box, right? It says healthy recipe. But when you look at the nutritional information on the back and we look at it and you, you realize that this cereal, it's 30% sugar, right? It's 30% refined sugar. Uh, and that is not, that's not a healthy product, right? But it says it's healthy on the box. It says new healthy recipe. So we're, yeah, we're teaching students to not just think about their health, but we're teaching them to, you know, to not trust everything at face value, to read and comprehend. And that is a reading task, isn't it? You know, that's a real task, reading the box. And that's something we could extend. We could ask our students to bring in some empty packets. We could do it online and they could hold up to the camera. We could compare and we can open up a dialogue with our students about this real information that has real world application. And I think it's something interesting, you know, students, they can compare the things that they like and you can find out, well, which out of these different cereals that you like, which is the healthiest. So it's something that students are gonna be interested in. Yes, let them assess, let them evaluate. Exactly, Albert. Okay, so this is a value lesson with real world application. I think this is a, lo a lovely activity. Okay, so, Let's talk now a little bit about structure. So English language teachers, we're often familiar with process writing. So we take our students through the many stages uh, that are involved in creating a piece of writing. And speaking is a productive skill, just like writing. But I think teachers rarely break down speaking activities in the same structured way that we do for writing. Um, and I think we should think of the, the speaking task as the final product in a process. 
So speaking activities should be scaffolded in a similar way to our writing lessons. So of course, speaking lessons have different objectives and there are many types of lesson, but I've broken it down into five general stages. Now, not all of these stages will be applicable for every speaking activity, um, but we're gonna go through and look at how these different stages can be used to support speaking activities. We're also going to look at some uh, examples and do some activities as we go. OK, so just a reminder, OK, the content you see today is either from Our World Second Edition, our primary title, or from Impact, which is our secondary title. So first stage, do the pre-work. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean everything in the lesson, everything in the unit before that speaking task. So we need to pre-teach the language that the students need to do that speaking task. This is usually found in the lesson somewhere. So it could be the grammar, the specific phrases, the vocabulary, all of this. Um, and the teacher should have the speaking task in mind from the beginning of that lesson, okay? I, we shouldn't just be tagging the speaking lesson, the speaking activity on the end. Now do this, right? So everything builds up to the speaking activity. Uh, B, explore the, exploits the content. So use and exploit the content. That might be a reading text, a listening text, a video. Um, these resources, um, these texts, they are modeling the language in context. And they're also providing students with ideas that they can use in their speaking. Uh, the tasks, these tasks that we'll do in the reading and the listening lessons, they're often actually um, giving students freer practice, uh, sorry, controlled practice um, of the language that they're going to use later in a freer speaking activity. And lastly, with checking answers, when we're checking the answers, um, I recommend that we use sentence stems to support students. I'm going to show you those later. And I think it's important to make an explicit link between all of this that comes before the speaking activity and the speaking task itself. We need to remind our students to use this target language. We need to remind them to use the ideas that they've learned about in the unit, because if we don't remind them, often they don't use that language, they don't use the target language. So here is an end of unit task from IMPACT, our secondary program. And this unit is about, um, it's called mix and match. It's about, uh, you know, making hybrids of things. And th this activity is that students have to invent a hybrid sport. So there's a written element here, but the biggest part of this is really explaining the sport that they've created to, to a group, okay? So they have to explain what this sport is and what it's all about. So we're gonna look through the unit now and we're going to see how different tasks that came earlier would help students with this task because it's not an easy task. So first of all, we've got a grammar point that is introduced. Now this grammar point is about uh, comparatives. It's about comparing two things. So if we're talking about a new sport, which is uh, created from taking two old sports, it's natural that we want to compare the new sport to the old sport. So we can say, well, this new sport is more exciting than the old sport, but it's easier to learn, okay? We need to use less equipment. So we can compare in a lot of different ways. We can also see here that there are pictures which are modeling um, and giving ideas of sports, new sports. So can you tell me in this, this is a sport called Bossable. What is Bossable? From looking at the picture, um, which sports are included here? Volleyball and trampoline, that's right. So it's volleyball on a trampoline. Um, I don't know if anyone's actually heard of this. It's actually kind of almost like kind of acrobatic. So in Bossable, uh, you get points for like doing flips and being more acrobatic. So it's kind of like volleyball, uh, gymnastics, acrobatics, jumping on trampolines. Um, so it looks like a lot of fun to play, but also it looks like a lot of fun to watch, right? So that's one example of a new sport. Okay, let's have a look at another one. Okay, can anyone tell me which two sports have been combined that you can see in this image? We've got Frisbee and 
it's frisbee golf that's right or disc golf as it's also called so it's frisbee and golf um this has an advantage of being much cheaper uh to play than golf because golf is notoriously expensive um and we can see here that by showing these images and there's another example here volcano boarding okay linking back to that image i showed you earlier volcano boarding is where we snowboard down an active volcano not sure if you would enjoy doing that or not. I may be a little bit worried about that one. Um, we can also see here we've got uh, vocabulary all through the unit. We've got this vocabulary, which is going to help aversion, cheap aversion, create, okay, a hybrid sport. So all of this vocabulary that goes along with the grammar and all of these images which are giving the students their own ideas, making it easier for them to generate ideas. We also have a speaking strategy here, which is giving clarification. When you're explaining something, a difficult concept, a new sport, we often need to use uh, this language to clarify because someone might not understand. So we can clearly see how all of these elements are going and leading towards that final task. OK. Let's have a look at section B. So we look to do the pre-work. Next, we've got understand the task. So understanding the task, um, obviously very, very important. There are lots of reasons that a speaking task might not be very successful. A very common one is that the students don't understand the task or they don't understand the questions. So we should be looking at it. We should be explaining the questions. We should be analyzing the task. We should be double checking. Um, otherwise, the task might fail. Uh, next, we've got brainstorm ideas. And th they need ideas to, you know, they need ideas to do the task. But they also, I find by brainstorming ideas, it helps students to get a clear image of what they're supposed to do. So just like just now, when we look to those images of hybrid sports, by showing th them those images, it helps them to understand their task, which is to make their own. Uh, make invent their own one. So I find that at this stage, doing a group brainstorm, this really helps students to fully understand what they are going to have to do, which is why I've put it under understand. Next, we've got give students a choice. Um, if we're talking about something like discussion questions, so normally what we do is we give five discussion questions, the students look at them, student A reads the question to student B, student B answers it, student B reads question two, student A answers it, and they go through like this. If we t tell our students, right, you've got a choice, okay, you only have to answer three of these questions, choose the three that you are interested in. This changes the task so that now before they ask the questions, they have to read them. And they have to understand them in order to choose the ones which they do want to answer, or they don't want to answer. So by giving them a choice here, we are enabling them, right, encouraging them to think critically about it, but also to, to make sure they understand the questions before they start doing it. I'm sure you've had the same thing. You give students questions, they just launch into it without any thought. So by giving students a choice, it helps them understand um, and it also empowers them a little bit. It gives them some ownership of the task. Um, and I find they put more effort in. So I think that is a really useful stage, usually useful tip. OK, last one here is model. OK, so part of understanding the task is seeing it being modeled. And the teacher can do this um, or perhaps the video or the audio um, that you're using. You know, for example, in Impact, we have explorers. National Geographic Explorers, and often they are modeling the language that we want the students to use. So we could use a video to model it, or the teacher could model the task themselves. But it's very important that the students see the task so that they get a better understanding. OK, so let's have a look at some content now and uh, see how that works. So this is a speaking activity from Our World, level three. And students do a reading about different lunches in different countries, and they then discuss. So let's take a look at this di uh, direction line. It says, talk about what the people eat. OK, so that is something that we need to check that the students understand. So if you have a look here, we've got a little graphic organizer talking about the different countries and what they eat. Yeah. So can you tell me when it says talk about what the 
people eat in the chat box who who are we talking about here are we talking about these two characters you can see in the picture or are we talking about someone else okay people in the class people in the pick Okay, so it's not the it's not the people in the pick. Okay, and uh, I've actually removed the reading. So in the book, there's actually a reading text here, and the reading text uh, is next to these pictures. It explains what a a typical lunch is like in France or a typical lunch is like in Japan. Right. So it's talking about the people in France. Okay, the people in Japan. So. The people, it's not talking here about these specific people, it's talking about the people in these countries. So it's talking generally about these countries. Okay, so let's have a look. Maybe you can tell me. So if we look at this, the image, it's a little bit small, but in France here, can you tell me what, what do people in France typically eat for lunch? Can you give me a few ideas? Okay, bread. Bread and cheese, right? Well done. Okay, pasta. Okay, I can't see any pasta there. I think I, cucumber, right? So we've got a salad, a cucumber salad. We've got cheese. Uh, we've got bread. We've got a pie, right? Yeah, some kind of pudding, a dessert, some kind of cake or a flan. Uh, we've got here, I think these are potatoes, and I think this is chicken, so meat, potatoes, okay? Great, well done. And a glass of water, right? Good spot, a glass of water. How about in Japan? Okay, can you tell me what people typically eat here, so we've got fish, rice, soup, right? Fish, rice, and soup. And this looks like orange juice or milk. Okay, sushi, I don't see any sushi there, but I know people in Japan do eat sushi. That's good, you know, you're, you're, you're personalizing it, you're bringing in your own knowledge. That's very good. Okay, now, there's a second part to this, which is what do you eat, right? So we could ask our students, what do you eat? Um, and we probably find our students use some of the ideas in the picture, but I think it would be a nice idea to, to get a bit more input from the students. So I would use a simple um, tea chart like this to get some more ideas from the students. So what I, what I would ask my students is, well, let's pick another country. We looked at France and Japan. Let's pick another country that has some famous foods from there and talk about what they eat there. OK, so can you think of and let's uh, well, you pick a country for me. OK, uh, Dea says Korea. OK, Korea was first. Right. So let's go. Let's go with Korea. OK, so I'm going to write Korea here. And then can you tell me someone's putting kimchi? OK, someone's putting bibimbap. OK, I'm sorry, my writing is not the best. Uh, ramyun. OK, kimbap. OK, kimbap. Right. OK, what, what is kimbap? Can you explain that? Or what is kimchi? Can you tell me? What, let's do kimchi first. What is kimchi? Topoki. Kimchi is cabbage, right? But what kind of cabbage? It's fermented cabbage, right? So we could talk about that, fermented cabbage. Um, how about uh, bibimbap? What is bibimbap? Yeah, kimbap is like sushi, someone's put there. Kimbap, it literally means rice and seaweed, seaweed and rice, yeah? It's a rice roll. Good. OK, very nice. Um, OK, yeah, so we can go through and we, we can mix rice with vegetables, says Frederick. That's bibimbap, right? Mixed rice with vegetables. So we can go through and we can get students to talk about any countries they want. and We can brainstorm these ideas. So now when we get students to do the task to talk about the food that they like, they have a lot more ideas and they can also talk about maybe things they don't like. Um, what I like to do in an activity like this is go to the internet, look at some pictures, maybe watch some videos. We can find a video of a Korean food blogger. Um, we could find some exotic food. OK, maybe some strange, unusual food. Can you think of a strange, unusual food that uh, is famous in Korea? Insects. Insect. Yeah. So um, live squid. Right. Yeah. Live squid or live, I think it's octopus. Uh, Nakji. Uh, live octopus, right? Um, insects, there was one uh, that I had when I, I used to live there, uh, which is why I like talking about, which were silkworms, okay? So silkworm larva, um, which they boil and you can buy on the street in a little paper cup. Um, yeah, so we can introduce all these ideas, okay? And we can get our students talking about what they like, what they don't like, um, but brainstorming it together um, 
you know, definitely makes this more engaging for our students. Okay, so our aim here is to check their understand, but also to give them more to talk about. Okay, let me clear my drawings here and we're going to go on to the next stage. Okay, so next stage, stage C is prepare for the task. So we've done the pre-work and we've understood the task. Preparing for the task, let's see. So once they've generated these ideas collectively, they need time to prepare individually. And this is very important that we give them time. It's very difficult just to, to launch in and start talking about something. So even if it's just a minute for a short activity, we give our students a little bit of time to think, to prepare, maybe make some notes, okay, before they start the speaking task. And if we do this, we're going to get have a better result. Uh, B, we're going to give students resources. So make sure they have all the language that they need. Maybe we put the language on the board or on the screen. Maybe we give them a handout. Uh, we're going to use, I'm going to use sentence stems, which I'm going to show you in a minute, or language frames. And while this is happening, while we're giving them this time to prepare, the teacher has an important job to do. The teacher is going to walk around the room. Uh, if you're online, maybe the teacher can message students individually to check that they're okay, to ask what they're going to talk about, offer some support like that. So the teacher is monitoring um, and guiding the students to make sure that they, um, that they can take part in the activity. Okay, so... I used what I used to do with these sentence stems I've mentioned, I used to print these, I used to laminate them and I used to hand them out in lessons. And at the end of the lesson, I would collect them back in. So I had one set which I could use with all my classes. Teaching online, you can send them in the chat box, you can send them in an email, you can put them on the screen, up to you, right? But it's easy to give students the language that they need. The point about these sentence stems does two things. Firstly, it Re reduces the cognitive load on our students, right? So that they can concentrate on what they want to say rather than how they're going to say it. The second thing it does is it gives them correct language. And once they use this time and time again, okay, when they've used it many times, it, it will sink in and they will naturally start to use this language. This is why I really like to use them. Um, you can see here that this, uh, these sentence stems are for um, discussing your answers. So after you do an activity, they, students can have a discussion about the answers using these sentence stems. But I also had sentence stems for different functions, such as giving or asking for opinions or agreeing or disagreeing with someone in the discussion and so on. So this is really about learner training and scaffolding. If students have the language that they need, they can use it. Um, here is an example that comes from IMPACT, and these sentence stems are in the back of the IMPACT student book, so they can use them anytime they want. Uh, this one is for asking for and giving information. So the way, one way, nice way to use this kind of language is with the kind of information gap activity. So let me explain how I would set this up. So I'm going to use this wonderful image here. Um, and a reading activity to, to develop a speaking activity. So I love this image. So I'm just going to ask you uh, into the chat box for me, what, what can we see on your screen right now? Uh, someone knows it exactly. It's a set out in Cancun, Mexico. Um, what's happening here? There's a man repelling, right? Okay. He's being lowered into this cave. And it's just such a wonderful image. It looks like it's from a movie, doesn't it? It looks like it's from, I don't know, a, an astronaut, you know, someone who's traveled to another planet and they're making this groundbreaking discovery. Um, such a wonderful photo. There are stalactites there, right? Okay, so lots of great vocabulary coming out here. So what I would do with this activity is I'd break the class into groups, group A groups and B groups. And to A group, I would give them just the image, okay, without the text, right? So I, I would uh, take a copy of this image and just give them that. And I would say to group A, I want you to make some questions based on the W question words, okay? Who, what, where, when, why? Who, what, where, when, why? Make some questions about 
this image that you would like answered. Okay, now to group B, I'm gonna give them the image and the reading text. And I'm gonna tell this group, uh, get some paper. This, remember, this is for secondary students. Okay, this is from Impact. I want you to make some notes under the headings, who, what, where, why, and when. Make some notes, short notes, okay, from doing the reading, who, what, where, why, when. Exactly, the five W1H questions, okay? And I'm gonna give them time so that they can prepare group A making their questions, group B taking notes. When the time, when I've given them enough time, five or 10 minutes, whatever it is, I'm gonna stop them and I'm now gonna take away the reading passage and just give the photo. So now group A and B group, they just have the image. No one has access to the text anymore, but Bs have access to their notes. And now we're going to do A, B pairs and student A is going to ask student B the questions that they made and student B is going to try to answer those questions based on the notes that they took. Okay, so let's have a look. Let's go back into the sentence stems that we had. So student A they're gonna make questions using the sentence stems here. So can anyone type in a question for me about, about the image that we saw using some of these sentence stems? So can you type a question for me that you would like answered uh, uh, from this picture here? Right, okay, so who is that person? I wonder why the man is there. I wonder how tall the cenote is, perfect. I wonder what equipment is required for the activity. Do you know where this is located? Wonderful, okay. Who is that man? Could you tell me why the man is there? So you, right, you're coming out with some wonderful questions here. And remember, the bees, they don't have access to the article. They've only got access to their notes. So some of the questions they can answer, they'll be able to say, yep, it's in Mexico. But some of them, they're not gonna know. So they're gonna have to say something like, I'm not sure, but I think, this is in Mexico, if they can't remember, right? Um, I don't know, uh, but I would say it's about 100 meters high or 50 meters high, let's say. So we're using this language, okay? It's, it's real, it's a real task because they don't actually know some of these answers, yeah? And then what we do after they've done that, once they've finished, we're going to hand out to the AB pairs, we're gonna give them back the reading text and together they're gonna to check if the, the answers that B gave were actually correct, okay? So they're gonna double check the answers by doing reading. So we've now given them a reason to read that they can, they can check, yeah? Um, someone says, would you mind telling me about the beauty? Oh, that's, yeah, very nice, very nice question. Okay, the beautiful place in that book. It's in Mexico. There we go. It is in Mexico. And this um, this is a National Geographic explorer. Um, his name is Guillermo de Anda. And his, he's an archaeologist. And his job, he, he, um, he researches ancient Mayan artifacts. And often he goes down into these caves to find these 2,000-year-old um, artifacts um, and it just looks like a really fascinating, wonderful job, doesn't it? Um, so yeah, it looks really, really interesting. Okay, so I think this is a very nice activity. Let's uh, move on to D. Okay, so section D. So we've done the pre-work, we understand the task, we've done the preparation. Now it's time to do the actual task. Uh, so after all, we've been preparing, okay, all this time for this speaking task. I want to point out that in the previous stages, there's a lot of speaking happening there, okay? There's lots of speaking happening, but it's this stage, stage D, where we're actually be going to meet the lesson objectives. So I want to give another model. So we gave one earlier. I want to give another model. Um, so you could do it yourself, but at this stage, I think it's better to get a student to give this second model. Um, it's the final chance to check that everyone knows what they're doing. We can use concept check questions to see if they can identify the good or the bad points from the second model. Uh, we can ask, okay, um, did he answer the question? Okay, was there anything they missed out? Um, so we can get the students actually to watch it and to give their feedback on whether they thought they can, the, the, the student modeled the task well or fully. And that way the student, uh, the teacher can understand its formative assessment. We can see, do they understand? 
And finally, we're actually going to do the task, right? And the teacher, when the students are doing the task, the teacher is going to listen. The teacher is going to take notes. Um, the teacher is going to make sure that students who finish early have something to do. Maybe they can repeat the task. The teacher is going to deal with problems. So what the teacher is not doing here is standing at the front, OK, just sort of checking what they're going to do next. Now, I'm saying this because, um, you know, I, I've done a lot of uh, teaching observations uh, where I've been watching other teachers. And this is something that I've noticed, especially in observed lessons, when teachers have a lesson plan they're following, they can be doing a speaking lesson and they're so involved in what they're doing that they're not concentrating on what the students are doing. So the teacher really needs to be listening to the students and making notes so that they can give feedback because it's that feedback from the teacher which is gonna help the students to improve. So it's such an important element. If you're teaching online, this is more difficult. Uh, perhaps what we're doing there is we're asking students to record it and send it to you, um, a short, you know, a short, piece so that you can give them some feedback it's very difficult to do online with 30 students in your class right so perhaps recording would be a good idea okay then we're going to give the feedback okay give positive feedback give some negative feedback okay things that maybe the majority of students weren't doing but be supportive right make sure you're referring them back to that target language okay did you use this language this is what we're aiming for because i find often students they get carried away and they forget okay you're teaching them the past tense but they're so involved in what they're talking about they completely forget to use the past tense right so we need to point this out in the feedback OK, let's have a look at another example. So here is a, another speaking task from our world. And we're going back now and we're going to talk about having the student model. OK, so this is the second model. Yeah. Um, in the software, the classroom presentation tool software that we have for all our programs, um, they are into they're interactive right okay so that we can actually uh, click on them and we can get activities that pop up as well as having all the audio all of the video so on the classroom presentation tool if i click these three buttons here um this activity pops up and this is a kind of ready-made um a ready-made sort of uh, brainstorm right which is going to help our student giving the model it's going to give them ideas you're right those of you uh, par um those of you typing in now, it's rock climbing, isn't it? Or bouldering. Okay, this is actually bouldering, we call this. So it's a kind of rock climbing just on, on boulders rather than on a cliff. So we're going to invite our strong student to, do a, to give a model. We've got some brainstorm here. I think to personalise it a bit more, we would ask our students for some other types of uh, exercise that they like to do. So can you type into the chat box for me with the same form, I like to? What other types of exercise do you like to do? So you've got, I like to swim, I like to play tag, I like to do yoga, I like to dance, I like to deadlift, Andrew Tiffany, wow. I like to hike, I like to do Zumba, right? Can we say Zumba? I like to Zumba. I, I feel like we probably can now. I like to play table tennis. I like to do kickboxing. I like to kickbox, right? Loads of ideas. So we can add some extra ideas again to help our student with the modeling. To give them even more scaffolding, even more support, we're going to add in some of our sentence stems. So here we go. I've added some sentence stems here. So the student now giving the model, they've got the content, they've got the language there, they just need to string it together. Someone's put here, I like to clean. Okay, I don't like to clean. That's definitely, I'm going to put that here. I don't like to clean because it is hard work, isn't it? So can you put, can you put together in the chat box now a few sentences together as if you were modeling this as a spoken activity? Okay, remember we're talking about exercise. So hang out with my friends, not really exercise. So can we put together a few sentences using these stems about how you would model this if you were speaking. I like to walk because it makes me feel better. Very nice, Damla. I usually play badminton on Sunday. I usually do Zumba on Mondays. I like to walk the dogs because it's relaxing. I hardly play tennis. Good, So, you, and that's great. You're adapting. I, I've put here I often, and you've gone for I hardly, right? So, you know, for 
older students, they would definitely be able to do that, wouldn't they? Or higher level students, they'd be able to adapt these sentence stems to give a wider variety of language. I like to run from people, right? I like to swim because it's good exercise. I usually take a walk on weekends. Perfect. So we can see you're modeling this language. That's absolutely great. Okay, so this is basically the second model, right? So we can we're incorporating all these ideas and um, we're making it really easy for our students to produce good language. Okay, let's move on to the next stage. We've got 15 minutes left. So we've done the task, right? Okay, now we're going to do uh, the last one. Okay, do the task again. So once the students have done the speaking task and the teacher has given feedback, there's a lot of benefit in um, doing the activity again. Now, why is that? Because the reason is that we've invested a lot of time and effort into preparing for this. So we want to get the maximum amount of speaking done with the preparation. So I suggest that we, when we do it again, we could do it in exactly the same way. Um, we could maybe swap partner. You know, doing the same task twice you know, for our students, it's, it's good practice. Um, we can definitely do that. Or we can actually have a twist. We can change the task slightly. We can perhaps personalize it a bit. So they're doing a very similar task. Um, and often students like to do that because we can give them some, uh, in, some uh, an opportunity to tailor or customize the task to something they're more interested in. After we've done the task again, uh, we're going to invite a few students to perform. Okay, this is what I suggest. Usually I, I ask for a volunteer and then I also pick someone who I think will do um, a good session, uh, a good presentation. And this is really model number three. Okay. And it's another peer model. So pick someone that you think's done a good job. Okay. And let them do a final model for the student. Uh, really important after they after they uh, do this performance in front of the class we need to give feedback again right so we can get peer feedback from their classmates okay what they liked about it and then the teacher can do that same thing where we're giving support we're giving praise and we're also giving them some things to work on right so we're giving them balanced feedback okay So let's have a look. Final bit of content we're looking at. Here is a reading lesson from Impact, um, and it's about jewellery. And again, it's a lovely image. So I'm going to ask you into the chat box now. OK, can you please type in OK what you can see here? And I'd like you to tell me what is the woman wearing and why do you think she's wearing it? You can see henna. You can on her fingers, henna tattoos. We can see gold jewelry, gold bands. Looks like it's for a wedding. She's from India. It's a dowry, a rich woman. Okay, she's about to get married. It looks like a Hindu wedding, wedding culture in India, right? So rings. We got lots of wonderful um, ideas coming in, um, and I think it. Yeah, I think it's so beautiful. It's just just a hand, but I think it looks looks so lovely, right? Especially with all this henna on the tattoos and the accessories there. Right, she's gorgeous. And it's just a hand, right? A gorgeous hand. Um, so we can talk about this. Okay, it's a nice image. Okay, and um, some of you mentioned it's in India. Does anybody know um, what jewellery represents in India? So jewellery has a special meaning in India. You can actually see it. I don't know if you can read it here. It's up here in the article represents wealth yeah someone's got it security who is that someone got it fatima's got it it represents security um and we can see here jewelry means security if a family has trouble with money they can always sell their jewelry so it does kind of represent wealth but it's really about security so it, it's financial security if you have if you have this jewelry it doesn't just look nice but it means that your family is safe okay so really uh, interesting cultural perspective there OK, so let's imagine okay, that um, we have some really nice discussion questions here. So let's imagine we've already done this. We've been through the stages. Students have done this discussion in groups. 
and we want to do this a second time. So we've given them feedback, um, but maybe we want to change the task slightly. So question one says, is jewellery important to you? Why or why not? Do you have a favourite piece of jewellery? If so, describe it. So our students have done this task, okay? They've talked about jewellery. This is for teenagers, right? So this is maybe for 14 year olds, something like that, okay? 13 or 14 year olds. How could we change this question very slightly? So it's a, it's a similar task, but different enough to keep them interested. How could we change the task? OK, so yes, accessories. Right. So we could change it from jewellery to accessories. OK, so that gives it a much broader scope. Right. And it might also interest boys a bit more because they could talk about maybe, um, I don't know, bags. Right. They could talk about their bags. Um, they could talk about you know, different things. So it, it's a, it's a bit less gender specific, perhaps. They can talk about their baseball caps. Right. Exactly. Thank you for helping me. We could also change the person. Is jewellery important to who? Someone else, right? So maybe, yeah, is jewellery important to teenagers? Is jewellery important to someone in your family, to your mother, to your grandmother? Okay, so we could change the person um, so that they're not talking about themselves. Is jewelry important to the poor? Right, okay, there we go. Okay, so that would be an interesting question, maybe one that they would find diff difficult. We'd probably need some setup with that one, I think. Right, is jewelry important, uh, important to attract partners? Right, okay, some very interesting ideas. And if we ask our students, they can come up with their ideas and they can decide what they want to talk about. It's using the same skills, but they're taking ownership of the task. Very good. Very nice ideas. OK, let's have a quick look at question two. It says compare and contrast reasons why people wore jewellery long ago in the past with the reasons that people wear jewellery today. So this is based on the information in the article, right, in the reading. So I think we could change this from jewellery. We could change it to something else, something they'd be more interested in. So what we're looking for, because this is important, right? Comparing and contrasting something old and something new. Right, so we could talk about gadgets, couldn't we? Um, we could talk about, well, maybe let's talk about phones, right? So compare and contrast reasons why people used phones uh, 50 years ago. So the people, why we, the reasons why we use phones today. So 50 years ago, phones were for basically finding out information, right? Okay, we called someone up to ask a question about something. But today, there, there are so many reasons why we use them. So yeah, communication, phones, um, social media, right? Okay, so why do people use social media? What did people use before social media? Okay, so we could talk about perhaps, um, we could compare something like media, traditional media with social media, compare and contrast a newspaper with Facebook, right? They're both types of media. We could talk about clothes, right? Maybe that that's quite, could be difficult, but yeah, we could talk about clothes. What were clothes like 20 years ago? So they might know about that. Um, excellent, so you're getting the idea. Talk about transport, right, okay. Talk about transport 20 years ago. Maybe we could show them a picture of like the electric bikes and the electric scooters we have today. What did people use 20 years ago, right? Um, so we're using the same skills. We're using the same grammar. We're using everything the same. We're just changing the topic to make it more interesting for them. Okay, great. So an, a light adaption of the task it gives students another opportunity to speak and use that target language. OK, so I'm going to start wrapping up my main point. So here are my general tips once again. Set expectations and make your class from an English speaking environment as far as possible. Obviously, it's not possible 100 percent, especially at younger ages. Two, support students and praise their use of English, okay? Give them as much praise, as much support, scaffold your activities, structure everything. And finally, um, remember speaking happens throughout the lesson. It's not only in that final task, use every opportunity to speak. Remember that we want things to be real, okay? So using real content is interesting, it's motivating and giving them real tasks 
in, and allowing them to use real language, okay, is really going to help them understand why they are learning this. Here are the five tasks, there's five stages I went through. And the main point here, as I said earlier, you're not going to go through every stage or every activity every time. But the main point I want you to take away from this is that speaking, a speaking lesson, okay, a speaking activity is a process. It's the final stage in that process. It's the structure of the lesson or the structure of the unit, which gives them the tools they need to do this task well. Keep in mind, preparation, scaffolding, and modeling are the three most important things here when setting up successful speaking tasks. Uh, the examples I used today came from our Young Learner title, Our World Second Edition. I was using level three. So this is an integrated skills program for pre-A1 to B1 level students on the CEFR for students aged six to 12. It is a very comprehensive program. It's Great, perfect for schools with a lot of teaching hours, six hours a week, up to six hours a week. And if you want a young learner program with balanced skills work, with lots of content, cross-curricular content and lots of projects, this is the ideal program for you. The main aims of our world are students will learn more, they will do more and they will achieve more. So it really is a fantastic program full of fascinating content cross-curricular content i also used examples from our secondary or teen program impact uh, impact has five levels um, this is from a1 to b2 on the cefr it's for secondary students and it helps students teenage students to better understand themselves understand each other and to understand the world they live in it features National Geographic Explorers, cross-curricular content, and it really encourages them to participate actively through giving them lots of choice in what they talk about um, and really giving them ownership of what they're learning. It's promoting the 21st century skills and encouraging them to become successful global citizens. OK, so that's the content that we looked at. Um, I have a final poll question for you. Um, which I'm just going to explain first. So I'm going to give you a poll question. If you select yes to the poll question, um, we're going to contact you, okay? Um, National Geographic Learning representative, or actually Andrew is going to contact you first to put you in touch with someone. Um, if you would like to know more about the materials we looked at before, or if you would like to speak to someone about what you've seen today or anything else um, that you know, might be a question that you have. OK, so I'm going to launch the poll now. So it just says, would you like to speak with a National Geographic Learning Sales representative or learning consultant about this program or another of your needs? Um, if you don't want to, that's absolutely fine. OK, but if you put yes, we are going to follow up with you. So I'm going to leave that running. OK, if you're on Facebook and you would like, you can you can leave uh, a comment in the comments okay and um or you can send us a message on facebook directly you can directly message us and we will get back to you okay so if you would like to speak to someone about one of these programs or something else please uh, contact us i'm going to leave that running and go down to the next part i know a lot of you are really interested in getting a certificate so if i can just ask you can you can you just stop commenting in the chat box for a moment because I'm going to put the certificate in the chat box okay so if you all stop commenting for a while then the certificate will stay still and people will be able to download it so I've just put it in okay I've just entered that into the chat box uh, Andrew's done it as well so if you stop can you stop commenting please stop it in the chat box okay I, it's lovely to have all these thank yous, okay, but we need we need you to stop so that people can see if that's right, okay. <laughs> Still people commenting. Andrew, keep putting it in, Andrew. So the certificate is there in the chat box. You can download it, okay, or you can just scroll up a little bit, scroll up and, and click download and you'll be able to download this now. If 
if you can't, uh, some people said earlier on their phone it was difficult to download. Um, we're going to send it to you tomorrow. OK, we're going to send it to you in an email and the email will get to you by the end of tomorrow. OK, tomorrow afternoon. So please give us some time. OK, please don't send us an email tomorrow morning asking about the certificate. We will send it to you by the end of day tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon, you will receive an email from us with the certificate and a link to the recording of today's session. OK by tomorrow afternoon. If you're watching live on Facebook right now, okay, if you send us an email, okay, then uh, we will send you your certificate, okay? All right, let's go down to the next one. So next thing, um, we have lots of upcoming webinars. Uh, Andrew, can you put the link into the chat box? So we've got some really good webinars coming up. You can see here in the chat box, uh, Andrew's just put the link there. We've got three coming up in, um, in September. The first one is from an award-winning author, Paul Dummett. Um, he's going to be talking about how to help students reflect and build background knowledge. That's going to be fantastic. He's an excellent speaker. On the 29th, we have another author, Ka Catherine Stanett, and our very own Andrew Tiffany. Uh, doing a webinar together. This is going to be really good. Catherine is going to be talking about kind of the theory, and then Andrew is going to be demonstrating how that works in our material. So this is going to be a really fantastic webinar as well. And on the 30th, I'm going to be back with another webinar talking about how to teach academic writing that is scaffolded, relatable and easy to teach. It's using one of our new programs called Reflect and I'm really excited. I really love this new program. So I hope you can join us. So please sign up to these webinars. We want to see you again. We'd also like you to become a fan. So please go to Facebook. OK, you can follow us, you can like us and then you will be you will automatically see everything that we've got, all of our, our events, OK, all of our teaching tips. Um, yeah, you'll see all of that. So please share. We've already got 12,000 followers. So please become part of our learning community. OK, so that brings me to the end. We're exactly on time, 7.01. Um, I think Andrew's been answering questions. Um, I, I, we've run out of time. I've only I've maybe got time for a couple of questions. Let me have a look in the Q&A box. Um, what do you do if your students are afraid of speaking up? Um, OK, so you're saying that students are often worried about the grammar. So I, I would say, you Yuanda, that we have to reinforce to our students that grammar is important, but more important is fluency. More important is people understanding what you're saying. So I think we, we just keep reinforcing to our students that it doesn't matter if you make a mistake. What we want to do is we want to get our message across. And we, the teacher's job to support, to praise, to get that message across. Um, and this will give them confidence, right? Okay, that's the most important thing, I think. Uh, Sylvana says, is it possible for the teachers to conduct the steps in different meetings or different time? Um, I assume you're talking about the steps that I that I was talking about there. Yeah, I think it's possible to do them in a different order. Okay, I think it's possible, depending on the task, just to take one of those ideas. You don't need to do all of those stages that I showed you, right? I'm just showing you sort of everything that's possible. But what we do need to do, we need to prepare. We need to give them time to prepare. We need to model and we need to support them. Okay, so we need to do these three things. Uh, Christopher says, is there a downside to keeping it real? Um, I think, Christopher, there's probably a an upside and a downside to everything in life. Um, I th in my opinion, using real content um, is has far more benefits than it has drawbacks. Um, I'm sure we could probably find a drawback to it. But in my opinion, it's mostly positive. Uh, Sarah says, some of my students give short answers. No matter how much we ask follow up questions, they provide us with short answers. I know, Sarah, uh, we, we've all had students like that. Um, some students just they, they, monosyllabic, right? They, they like to give one word answers. 
it's difficult. We can't force students to do it, right? We can encourage them as much as we can. Um, I find that those students sometimes, if they work, maybe to me, they'd give one word answers, but sometimes with a partner, they would give longer answers. So it's all about trying to build trust in the classroom, about trying to make students feel comfortable. And in the end, okay, with a lot of those students, we can, in the end, you know, make them feel comfortable enough and safe enough and, uh, you know, to have enough um, respect um, and trust in you that they will start to open up and speak more. Someone's asking about if we have a webinar on public speaking or how to conquer fear in public speaking. Someone actually sent me an email about this earlier. Um, we, we don't do webinars on that, but one tip I'm going to give you, um, something that, you know, that I do when I'm giving life, when I'm, when I'm doing live training, is practice, right? So I, I write out almost like a script and I practice giving that speech many times and then I record myself and I record myself several times until I hear it and I think, yeah, that's what I want. So I keep recording it until I feel that it's a, I've done a good version and then I listen to that version, okay? So I keep listening to that version until I'm confident enough to replicate that live so that's a little tip for you there okay i think we're out of time okay it's five minutes past seven so um i, I i'm gonna let you go um so i'm gonna stop uh i'm gonna stop sharing my screen and i'm gonna stop recording so thank you very much to everyone who joined us today um i hope that you had a good experience with us today when you finish when when we close the webinar actually there will be a very short survey so if you could just complete the three questions there that would be great yeah and um andrew and i are looking forward to seeing you again at our future webinar so sign up keep healthy have a great day have a great evening have a great day tomorrow and um, we will send you that email by the end of tomorrow with the recording and your certificate so andrew you can end the session now okay goodbye everyone